You can take all of the anti-inflammatories that you want and eat a low inflammatory organic diet. But if you've got belly fat, you've got a baseline high level of inflammation that is negatively impacting you and is going to cause you to age and experience negative health outcomes much more significantly than if you're able to let go of that belly fat. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. I'm Dr. Ashley, and today we are going to dive into the popular topic of longevity and anti-aging. I know a lot of people don't like that idea of anti-aging, and so I get that. Let's call it aging gracefully. Let's say it's how do we go along and live the longest life here on this earth and enjoy our time while we are here. So that's what we're going to do. Let's say that you're 40 in your 50s, 60s plus, you're 40 pounds overweight. Well, that weight, your lifestyle, the environment can have a lot of impact on your health and result in speedier aging. So today we're going to talk about the topics that you can do to reverse that aging, slow it down a little bit, let's say, and heal from the inside out. So, you know, I want you to know that healing from the inside out, age regressing is possible. And we see that happen with our clients at PhD all the time. I mean, we always say you're going to age regress it a decade in how you look and feel. People are really concerned, for example, dropping the weight and that if they're older, uh, their skin is going to just sag and they're going to look older than they feel like they already do with the excess weight on their frame. But that's actually not the case, especially when you're working with PhD because we don't severely restrict calories. We have you eat nutrient dense, really healthy, whole foods. Skin actually looks a lot better. And I had a client, Cindy, email me and she's like, when I do the PhD program and I follow the meal plan religiously and I eat your foods, which are high quality protein, my skin feels tighter. And I saw her in the office and she said the exact same thing. She's like, I don't understand why, but she's like, I sent my friend here who's already dropped a lot of wheat to learn how to eat from you guys because he was concerned about the excess skin that he had. And so really when you go about dropping weight, I don't want you to fear the excess skin. I don't want you to fear looking older or aging because really what you're going to do from the inside out is age regress a decade, truly. If you look at the before and after pictures on the website, myphdweightloss.com, you will see how people look significantly younger in their after picture than they do in the before. And it's not just skin. Like you really are healing inside. Uh, I have a client, Tim, and Tim came in to us because he was struggling with prostate cancer. And I've shared this story before about him. It's a really profound story. He had prostate cancer. He was too heavy to get on the radiation table close to his home. So he was going to have to travel 45 minutes multiple times a week to get therapy, to get treatment for cancer. So he came in to see us and he had also at the time retired from his job because he didn't think he had much time left to live. And so he came in to see us. He said, I have to drop 30 pounds right away so I can at least get on the table to get treatment radiation for my prostate cancer and not have to drive so far away. Well, he dropped 30 pounds in about three weeks with us. The first part was really quick for him, and he was able to get that treatment for prostate cancer. And a year later, he's down over 120 pounds. He's off all of his medication for cholesterol and high blood pressure. He was able to reverse those conditions. And the best thing about Tim is that he's like, oh my gosh, I've got all these years to live. I've got so much more to give. He's now dating again and he's with a really great lady and he's really excited. And he's now a team member at PhD because he said that he wants a get to job. And now that he's going to live a lot longer, he needs to keep making money and he wants to give back to people in the way that PhD gave to him. So I just want you to know I share this story with you because if you feel like you are stuck and that you're continuing to age and you don't know what to do, well, I'm going to talk about all the steps. But the number one step is if you're carrying excess fat weight, especially if you carry it in the belly, you need to let that go. I have another client, Susan, and she told me when I was in the office, in one of our offices actually recently, and she came in, she gave me a great big hug, and she said she was walking around her neighborhood, and she saw a neighbor, and the neighbor called her by her younger sister's name and thought that she was her younger sister. She just couldn't believe it. So um, it is totally possible to age regress and heal inside out. So the thing that you need to understand is that the body is pretty darn forgiving. We have been blessed with a pretty darn amazing gift here. 
and you can reverse a lot of the damage that you've done and you can reverse it pretty quickly but the quicker you catch it the quicker you do something about it the better and a lot of folks wait for an emergency to hit them over the head and they're like oh my gosh i've hit rock bottom i've hit a low i need to do something about it now or you can choose right now is your threshold, right? You don't have to hit this lows. You can totally just choose right now after hearing this episode, you can just hit the reverse button and make the choice. So this reminds me of a client, Todd, that I have, and he is amazing in what he's accomplished. So he dropped 90 pounds with us at PhD. Before coming to PhD, he dropped 40 pounds. So that's 130 pounds of total weight loss. And he still had about 30 more pounds to go. And at that point, when he was right there with 30 more pounds to go, he's like, you know what? I'm just going to take a pause. I feel good enough. This is great. I'm done. And I said, okay, that's fine. But keep checking in with us, you know, with our clients. We never let you go. Just keep coming in so we can make sure you understand this. Because, you know, with his significant weight gain, this was a genetic predisposition. Like he had struggled with this weight since he could ever remember. He's two years old and he was struggling with obesity. And so with that type of work, you have to constantly practice to keep that weight off. And so he went a little rogue and I hadn't heard for him in months. And so uh, six months later, he calls me and he's like, Dr. Ashley, I just had a heart attack and I'm freaking out. I put 20 pounds back on and I went into the doctor. I had major chest pain. I felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest, all the things that you hear And they went in and removed some buildup in there. I think it was called the widow's maker is when you've got a clog in there in the aorta. And so they went in and did that. And the doctor's like, hey, dude, Todd, you've got to stop smoking. You are no longer a smoker. And so when he chatted with me, he's like, I knew I shouldn't smoke. My dad died of a heart attack from smoking and being obese. I knew that I needed to check in with you. This is the type of person I am where I needed the hammer to hit me over the head. And I am here and I'm ready to go all the way. So I'm sharing this story with you to help you understand that some people need to hit these lows. And I also have hope that for a lot of you listening, you don't have to experience that scary low and that you can just hit the reverse button and make some of these changes going forward. So that's my goal. So let's talk about these 10 steps. So number one, you need to drop the weight. Remember that the visceral fat is like kryptonite, the fat in your belly, which I talk about a lot in previous episodes, the fat in your belly is active. These fat cells secrete hormones that cause inflammation in the body. One of the main hormones that it secretes is called uh, interleukin-6, and interleukin-6 is actually a cytokine, and it creates this baseline high level of inflammation in the body, and it's linked to heart disease and cancer and skin irritation and autoimmune conditions. You can take all of the anti-inflammatories that you want and eat a low-inflammatory organic diet, but if you've got belly fat, You've got a baseline high level of inflammation that is negatively impacting you and is going to cause you to age and experience negative health outcomes much more significantly than if you're able to let go of that belly fat. So that's number one is fully collapse that belly fat just like Todd is going all the way. He's going to get rid of that belly fat so he can drop that baseline level of inflammation in the body. And it does. It impacts every aspect of your health. So it is kryptonite and you're going to let that go. Now, number two is when you think about aging gracefully, you need to focus on your nutrition. And this will also help you drop the visceral fat if you've got some going on there in your belly. So optimizing your nutrition is decreasing your carbohydrate intake underneath your unique tolerance level. So I'm not saying you need to be uh, following a severely low carb diet. You don't need to be Atkins or keto, but you do need to understand your carb tolerance level and eat within that. So everyone always asks me, how do I determine my carb tolerance level? Well, number one is if you are into the science and into the data, you could get a continuous glucose monitor. You can stick that little device on your arm and it measures your blood glucose response in response to certain foods. So you can see the foods that make it cause a massive spike and you can see the foods that allow it to just increase as it should in a healthy individual. Or number two, you can just use the signs and symptoms that your body is experiencing. And this is what we do for clients at PhD. Now, we're experts at pulling different strings to figure out where each person needs to be. But you can experiment on your own. So, for example, you can try dropping your carbohydrates to under 150 grams per day could be a good start. 
and then you could drop it to 100, you could experiment with 80, you could experiment with less than 50, and kind of use those little borders, boundaries to experience how you feel. And when you're eating underneath your carb tolerance level, you should feel like you are not hungry and you don't have cravings. The weight should continuously drop off. Uh, you should sleep well, you should have good mental clarity and good focus. So if you're feeling like all of those things are happening to you, then it's very likely that you're eating underneath your carb tolerance level. In general, you're going to avoid processed foods, foods that come in a box, foods that can stay on your pantry shelves for years are things that you're going to let go of. You're going to find that your fridge is much more full and your pantry is not quite as full. You're going to let go of juice and skim milk is just really high in sugars. It's going to spike your glucose levels. Listen to my episode where I talk about what to eat for breakfast, and that will help to clarify these things. Decreasing alcohol in general is going to be better for the aging process. I know a lot of us don't like to hear that. Making sure that you're getting adequate protein to support your muscle mass. As we age, muscle mass generally naturally reduces because we don't eat as much, we don't move as much, but you can prevent that. You can work up against that so you don't experience that same situation of muscle mass reduction. So make sure you're getting adequate protein, about 0.8 to 1 grams of protein per pound optimal body weight. So what I mean by that is if right now you weigh 250 pounds, but your ideal healthy weight is 140 pounds, then you might be eating about 130 to 140 grams of protein per day, making sure that you're getting about 30 to 40 grams of protein in that first meal and last meal of the day. Now, if you're a PhD client listening to this and the amount of protein that you're getting throughout the day is different than what I just explained, that's because your program is specifically customized to your needs and your weight loss journey. So do not fret. You're right where you want to be. When you're looking at protein, remember that beans don't count. Beans are not a protein source. Nuts are not a protein source. Cheese is not a protein source. Nuts and cheese go more toward your dietary fat for the day, and beans are really a carbohydrate sugar type of uh, macronutrient. So I just want to be clear on that. I went to Tennessee a few weeks ago, and, and lots of people were eating baked beans like they were a protein source. And baked beans, I want you to think, is actually a dessert. It's like equivalent to eating a piece of cake, let's say. A little more fiber maybe. Um, but if that cake was made with a little zucchini in it or something, man, it'd be equal. And the baked beans might have more sugar than that. Making sure you're getting healthy fats, making sure your veggies that you eat are colorful, like purple cabbage, radishes, um, berries that are going to be all different colors, specifically strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries, and then getting in fermented foods like sauerkraut or kefir to help with your gut health. You could consider time-restricted eating, so some intermittent fasting in there, and I've done a previous episode all on intermittent fasting, so if that interests you, go and dive into that episode. But in general, the fasting can help improve metabolic health. It promotes longevity, but there's still a lot more research needed on the length of time that you need to fast to experience it. The reason why fasting works is because it helps with autophagy, meaning that it removes damaged cells in the body and helps the new healthy cells come up. It kind of pulls out, you can imagine them like zombie cells, and it allows the body to slough those away and let new cells come up. So there's a few different ways of fasting, making sure that you get 12 hours before in between your dinner meal and your breakfast meal the next day is important. Some people like to fast for 16 hours every day and then have an eating window of eight hours during the day. That can be helpful. But again, when you dive into the research, when it comes to anti-aging and longevity, most shows you need to fast for about 24 to 72 hours in a row, and you could do that once a quarter. Fasting also helps with insulin sensitivity, reducing inflammation, but the risks are muscle loss. If you do too much fasting or you're not eating really well during the eating window, you can lose significant muscle mass, and that is a big thing as we age. So you don't want to do anything that would be detrimental to it. So if you are doing the fasting, making sure you're focusing on the protein requirements that I mentioned earlier is going to be key to your success there. Number three is exercise. Remember, exercise is a wellness tool. It's not a weight loss tool, but there are specific types of exercise that are specific to longevity. So here I'm talking about longevity, anti-aging, not necessarily weight loss. And 
For when it comes to longevity, I really like to follow Peter Atia. He has a podcast called The Drive. He is a brilliant guy, and he has looked at all of this when it comes to longevity. And so his suggestions when it comes to exercise are four different types. So number one is stability, and that might be like 10 minutes of stability work a day. It could be Pilates, it could be yoga, it could be balancing on one leg and then the other. But um, looking up online, you could easily do that. What are the good types of activity for stability? And that's going to vary according to each individual and what they like to do. The second type of exercise is uh, going to be strength training. And you should really do three full body exercises from a strength training perspective each week with your focus on aging gracefully. And strength training could be anything from body weight to lifting weights. It doesn't need to be anything major, but you do want to make sure to get your biggest bang for your buck, again, from a longevity perspective, is full body. The reason why is because let's say you're doing squats, your body has all of the blood and oxygen in the big leg muscles, and then you go and you do some upper body something, it's going to have to shunt all of that up to the upper muscles in the body, and then it's going to shunt it all the way back down when you start doing your squats again. So doing full body and alternating between lower body and upper body is really helpful metabolically. Another fellow that I really like to follow is Mark Sisson. He wrote this really great book a while ago called The Primal Blueprint. If you haven't read it, I suggest you read it. It's still a really great read. And he talks about exercises being much more functional when it comes to strength training. And so what he suggests is push-ups. And you can do this all modified, by the way. You can start on your knees. You do whatever you can do. But I'm going to talk to you about what the goals are. The goals from a functional longevity perspective, if you're a guy, is to be able to do 50 real push-ups. And if you're a lady, 20 push-ups in a row. The next thing would be some kind of chin-up or pull-up. Remember, you can do this assisted on the chair. You could use a Smith machine bar and put your legs down so you're on an incline and just pull your chin up to the bar. You could use TRX straps and pull up, but something for the back muscles. And the goal is 12 chin-ups or pull-ups for men and five for women. And oh my gosh, I know that that is tough. So know that you can do it assisted. The next thing is squats. And you can do that in any way with weights, without weights, but that's about 50 in a row no matter if you're a male or female. And then something above head. So Mark Sisson says to do a handstand for like 30 to 60 seconds. I never got there. It gives me major vertigo. But you want to do something to strengthen the shoulders. And then the last thing is a plank. And that goal is two minutes of a plank on your forearms and on your toes. But you could always do it on your hands and with your knees down or any kind of Um, assisted support there. But the goal is to be able to do all of those exercises in that amount and then repeat it once more. So the whole thing would take 20 minutes, but man, you'll be sore after it if it's your first workout, but it's great and you can do it at home. So that's strength training. And then we drop into aerobic. And aerobic, according to Peter Atia, should be done a few times a week at a 65 to 75% of your max heart rate. So You can do the talk test, the speak test to assess where you are with this heart rate thing. So let's say you're on a stationary bike, just as an example, and you've got your friend right next to you. If you're at 65 to 75% of your max heart rate, you could talk to them, but it wouldn't be comfortable. If your mouth was shut, you could breathe through your nose. If you are talking to your friend, you would want to take pauses because it's uncomfortable to continue to talk. Now, if you were talking to them and you have to pause after every three words, that could be zone three. That would be a little bit more intense and you'd want to pull it back a little bit. If you want a really accurate equation to determine your heart rate, let's say you're really into the numbers, you wear a heart rate monitor. This is the equation 208 minus 0.7 times your age and then multiply that answer by 0.65 to get 65% of your max heart rate. And then you can do the same thing and multiply it times 0.75 to get 75% of your heart rate. And that's the range if you're wearing a heart rate monitor. I personally would just be talking to no one next to me and see if I can talk for a few sentences or not. So that is aerobic. And then anaerobic. Anaerobic is the type where you cannot talk to someone and it's high intensity interval training. I talk a lot about high intensity interval training because it's really helpful when you want to improve insulin sensitivity, when you want to drop weight. It just really pulls all the glycogen out of your muscles and it's really helpful to overall health. 
So what this would look like, one example would be, again, on that stationary bike, and you warm up for five minutes, and then you push really hard for about 30 seconds, and then you go easy for about a minute to a minute and a half, and then you push again, whatever really hard means to you, and then you pull back. If you're a runner, instead of just going for a monotonous run, you could go easy while you're running and then sprint really, really fast for 8 to 15 seconds and then pull back, go easy, and repeat that about 10 times, you guys, is all it takes, and it's about 20, 25 minutes, so it's short and sweet. And then the last thing that research has shown is really important from longevity, it might sound weird, is grip strength. If your grip strength isn't strong, then everything underneath it is easy to fall away. And so to do this, you could imagine a dumbbell and you grip the top of it, or you could grip like a can of spaghetti sauce. It'd probably have to be harder than that. And you just hold that and you walk around with it. It's also a way to do a farmer's carry where you can hold a weight plate and walk around with it or a kettlebell. But that grip strength is really tough and you want to be able to hold something for about 45 seconds to 60 seconds. If you can hold it longer than that, then you can go up and wait. I was at F45. It's kind of a functional training. Actually, I think the F stands for functional and it's 45 minutes long. So F45. And they had us hanging from a pull-up bar and all we had to do was bring our knees up to our chest and bring them back down. Oh my gosh, I had such a tough time and that was grip strength. I couldn't even just hang there. He said, just hang there on the bar. And I could not hang there for longer than probably 10 seconds. So it is a real thing and it's tough, but it shows if you have greater grip strength, then you have less risk of cardiovascular disease, less risk of disability and just general mortality. So in general, these are the types of exercise. Don't get overwhelmed. Pick one thing. Maybe just start with the grip strength, a little bit of resistance training. And when you do your movements, mimic real life. That's the goal. We want to be healthy as we age. Okay, number four is stress management. And I talk a lot about stress in a previous episode. So again, I'm not going to dive into it. But the deal is when you're stressed out, you've got high levels of cortisol and cortisol levels that are chronically elevated result in a low level of inflammation. You guys are probably finding a theme here. We don't want to have levels of inflammation in the body because it just wears things out. So it shortens telomeres. So our chromosomes are and telomeres are a certain length. And we've got these protective caps on top of our chromosomes. When we're stressed out, it naturally shortens those telomeres. And when we age, we see these naturally shorten. And so the significance of stress increases the speed at which these shorten, which is not a good thing. It results in DNA damage. We produce more reactive oxygen species. It increases risk of cancer and aging. It impacts brain health, and it actually changes the structure of our brain. So a big thing there. And then in my episode, when I talked about stress, I talked about the perception of stress and how you view your stress actually impacts your body physiology. So if you are stressed out, I really encourage you to change your outlook on stress, that maybe it's overcoming a challenge rather than really having significant stress. How can I change that mindset? Is it a challenge that I can overcome? And then the body actually secretes different hormones if you think something's a challenge over something that's a defeat. Number five is consider supplementation. You want to make sure that you take the right type of supplements. Cod liver oil is something that we all should be taking. I know it doesn't taste very great. I tried to take it in a liquid and had to go to capsule because I just couldn't stand it. But cod liver oil is really important. It has vitamin A, vitamin D, and you want to take it with vitamin E to help the absorption of it. All of us are pretty much deficient in copper, so you might consider that. A berberine is really helpful for blood glucose control. Remember to take your electrolytes with your water so that you stay as hydrated as possible. Uh, Make sure that you take a good type of vitamin C, specifically a liposomal vitamin C, or there is a whole food, different sources that come straight from the berry form of vitamin C. And then vitamin D is really important as well. You can get that from the sunlight during the spring and summer and early fall months. You can take supplementation form of it, or there's actually a light that I've been investigating and you sit in front of it 
for a few minutes and it helps your body naturally convert to vitamin D, but our body actually goes through different cascades of events when we convert the active form of vitamin D from the sun versus just taking a supplement. It skips some really important things. So these supplements are things you can consider. This None of this is meant to be medical advice, by the way. So I want to make sure that if you do consider taking any of these supplements, you always check with your doctor first before adding or subtracting anything. Hey there, need extra support staying hydrated while shedding pounds and maintaining weight loss? Introducing Dr. Ashley's Electrolyte Plus, which I created just for this purpose. Packed with evidence-backed ingredients like vitamin D, C, and zinc for immune support, B vitamins for energy, and a blend of full-spectrum electrolytes and minerals to hydrate, stabilize glucose levels, and curb cravings. Visit DrAshleyWellness.com and use code ASHLEY10 for 10% off your first purchase or 20% off your first subscription order with free shipping. Plus, enjoy a 30-day money-back guarantee. Back to the show. When it comes to medications, uh, metformin was considered for a while a good longevity medicine, but now they're thinking, hmm, maybe not. So all of the stuff keeps shifting. Uh, rapamycin is something that helps to remove those zombie cells, and it's a medication, but more research needs to be done on dosage and frequency. Number six is to consider genetic testing, hormone testing. I'm going to list some examples of stuff that you can look at. Finding a, a really good doctor who listens to you, who can do these tests is important. My husband actually, Dr. Doug, he has a practice optimal human health where he's done all of these tests on me. And that's where I've gotten all of these from. So I'm not an expert here, but I do know what is important. And it's important to also have a doctor who knows how to read these things so that they then can move on and give you the right type of suggestions for supplements and medications and action steps. So ApoE is an important genetic marker, which can determine if you're predisposed to develop developing Alzheimer's disease or not. And if you learn of that early, you really can take good preventive measures. The MTHFR is a gene that doesn't allow you to use the folic acid that comes in a lot of vitamins, and it, it has to do with folate metabolism and cardiovascular disease. So you really want to know if you've got that genetic SNP. An interesting thing to know is that folic acid you'll find in most multivitamins is a synthetic form. And if you've got this MTHFR thing, you cannot create the folic acid into the active form and your body cannot use it at all. So it doesn't do you any good. What you want to make sure you're looking at in your vitamins is that the folate is a methylfolate, which is the active form that your body can utilize. Making sure that you know where your hormones are, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, growth hormone, looking at your thyroid levels and making sure you're getting the right tests. I do have a YouTube video on the four things that can slow your weight loss speed and hypothyroid is one of them. And a lot of times when you go to your doctor, they don't test for the right thing. So I'm going to list out what I want you to take a peek at if you go to your doctor so that you can be an advocate for yourself. So you want to look at TSH total T3 and T4, free T3 and T4, reverse T3, TPO, and antithyroglobulin antibodies. So if you get your thyroid looked at, get all of that done. You want to check out cortisol. You could consider looking at that through urine or saliva if you feel like you live a really stress-filled life. A CRP is a simple blood test that looks at inflammation making sure you're looking at A1C, which is a three-month average of your blood glucose levels, and making sure your fasting blood glucose level is under 100. And then looking at cholesterol, I've done another episode all on cholesterol, so check that out. But looking at ApoB and LP little a there for cholesterol is key. And then just your basic screenings, like a DEXA scan you should get to see how your bone health is doing. Don't skip the colonoscopy just because it sucks or a mammogram because it's totally uncomfortable. You want to make sure that you get those tests done. Number seven is looking at your environment. Remember that we can get a lot of pesticides and yucky things through our environment. And so one thing you can do, and I've mentioned this on previous episodes, is check out EWG, E-W-G, for the Environmental Working Group. And put your shampoo in there. Put your deodorant, your toothpaste, your cleaning supplies. Go put that into this database, and it will push out a number as to if it has a lot of 
toxins in there, a lot of chemicals, or if it's really a safe item to use. Okay, the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 are lists of veggies and fruits that either have a lot of pesticides, and if they do, you want to consider getting the organic type. And if they don't, then you're good to not have to spend crazy money on the organic version of it. So I'm going to read these off to you guys so that you can put them in your brain and understand what you should be looking for at the grocery store. So the Dirty Dozen includes strawberries, spinach, kale, collard greens, and mustard greens, peaches, pears, nectarines, apples, grapes, bell peppers, both hot and the sweet ones, cherries, blueberries, and oddly enough, green beans. I think that's a new one. And then the Clean 15 includes carrots, watermelon, sweet potatoes, mangoes, mushrooms, cabbage, kiwi, and honeydew, asparagus, sweet peas, papaya, onion, pineapple, corn, and avocado. So those are the ones that you don't necessarily need to get or is organic. If we go back to the detoxing, the environmental aspects, glutathione is a supplement that you can consider taking. It tastes like sulfur. Oh, it's really rough, but I have taken it before. Uh, some people don't mind it. You want to get the liposomal type where you squeeze it into your mouth, sometimes under your tongue. And then just staying hydrated. You can try saunas to sweat out all the toxins. And then most importantly, get good sleep and manage your stress. Number eight is sleep itself. Make sure that you've got a good routine. Make sure that your environment when you sleep is conducive to that deep sleep. So making sure it's cool, it's really dark, that you don't look at screens at least an hour before you jump into bed. And then make sure you check out my previous episode on sleep so you can get all the details. Number nine, we're almost near the end, but stick with me because these two are really important when it comes to continuing to keep your brain on track and as young as possible as we age gracefully. And so number nine is community and social connections, having a sense of purpose, being around others. It is wild to see those who have a sense of purpose, who have a community, who are around people they love, actually secrete significantly more serotonin and dopamine, and it decreases feelings of depression, anxiety, and then physiologically your body also responds in a positive way by reducing blood pressure, increasing heart health, uh, really helping with repairing your DNA, and it just shifts the chemicals in your body that stimulate growth of neurons, which is really important as we continue to age. And then the last thing is continuous learning, like always doing something that challenges your brain. So you could brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand. I've done that for a while, and it's super uncomfortable at the beginning, but it's amazing how your brain can adapt. Uh, you could do crossword puzzles. You can do Sudoku, I know, is a favorite game that people do to, to really trigger different areas of the brain. And then hand-eye coordination is also important. Like you could pick up pickleball, for example. So continuing to learn and grow and learn new skill sets and surround yourself by people who challenge you in positive ways is really a big aspect of aging gracefully. So I know this is a lot of information. I hope that it provided you with great value. I don't want you to get overwhelmed. So my step, my homework for you is to pick maybe three to four things that you can take action on and implement it. And then come back to this episode and listen to it again and pick up three to four more things. So if you are watching this on YouTube, please drop a comment below. Let me know what your longevity plan is and what you already do every day to age gracefully. And then also let me know if you've picked up anything from this information and what you plan to implement into your routine. And of course, any questions that you might have, I'll read these comments and respond. Um, if you're listening to this on a podcast platform like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please do follow and leave a review. So remember, you got to step up to make the change. Lead with your heart, train your mind, and do not negotiate with your body. See you next time. 